Live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's The Q at the HP Vertica Big Data Conference 2014. Brought to you by HP. With your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Boston, Massachusetts for HP's Big Data Conference. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signals from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the co-host with Jeff Kelly in this segment, Wikibon analyst and big data analyst uh, here inside theCUBE. And our next guest is Brad uh, Hooper, VP of Technology, Office of the CTO of TIBCO, and it came from Spotfire. Welcome to theCUBE. It's great to be here. Um, TIBCO's been around the block for a long time, and everyone in the web business knows the, the uh, success they've had in web services and all and, and beyond, right? Notifications, events, large, large scale complex stuff, uh, pulling it together. Mm -hmm. But now we're in a different world, so <laughs> give us the update. I'm obviously still relevant. What's the new thing at TIBCO for the folks who want an update? Give them a quick update on where you guys are at position-wise, what's your key markets? Sure, so TIBCO, you know, long-standing uh, player, uh, key player in the integration business, but uh, TIBCO's been expanding our technology and use cases pretty dramatically over the past 10 years to include, in particular, event processing, which we were one of the innovators in that area, but we've recently, in, with our business events product, we've recently added stream-based acquisition coming from Michael Stonebreaker kind of heritage. Um, <clears throat> also analytics, the Spotfire team that I hail from before you know, becoming part of TIPCO proper. And uh, recently added Jaspersoft as well for embedded analytics. Yep. So we're, we've been uh, pretty focused on this the, the use cases that involve understanding data and then taking action on data in a kind of closed loop, uh, full circle. So you must like the uh, segment we did with Tom Davenport we just had oh, yeah. around business competitive advantage. Um, that's your shtick right now, I'm using data <coughs> for dollars, both top line revenue generation, but also for competitive strategy. Absolutely, uh, Spotfire actually was featured in his Competing on Analytics book uh, back in the day, and we're still doing that. Um, our, one of our key uh, concepts is that automation on its own is impossible. You need to have, what are the rules actually that are going to run, and what are the decisions and the actions that you're going to take. So this idea of combining human-based decision making with automated kind of events response and action taking, and that, that loop is, is really, is really right, critical. So let's get Jeff Kelly to kind of tell us the real deal here. Let's find out, does that make sense? Do you agree with what, what Brad was saying? I mean, I mean well, also he's a little bit biased, but <laughs> credible, he's the VP. Sure. Uh, techie. So, what's, well, what's your take? I, I certainly agree that uh, you, you need a co you need a, a combination of both the automation uh, to make those real time decisions, where you actually have we actually have a system making intelligent decision decisions based on real time analytics. You've got the human aspect, which you can't take out of the equation, um, both in terms of uh, you know kind of validating that the real time automated decisions and actions are correct and doing some of that deeper analysis, historical analysis, that really feeds the models that you're building Absolutely. that move into automation. So it sounds like, well, what I'd like to ask about is you know, the kind of the marriage of both the, kind of the traditional TIBCO side with the both Spotfire and now Jasper stuff. Maybe, you know, I do have some more questions <coughs> around Jasper in particular. Right. Um, Did that go into Spotfire? You guys put that together or is it still separate? That's, that, that's it is question. together yeah. actually at this point. Um, we, we combine those into an analytics group, um, which is run by Brian Gentile the former leader of uh, Jaspersoft. So, yeah. Right, so, how, so, so basically how are you integrating those two different, those two parts, the kind of the TIBCO proper <laughs> and the more the analytics side in a way that closes that loop, you use that term, and I think that's a good one. Yeah. Um, we heard yesterday in the keynote about that from Colin Mahoney, not just about closing the loop, but tightening that loop, mm -hmm. continually um, you know, tweaking it and, and fine tuning it. How do you guys go about marrying those two, the, the automation and the analytics? Right, well, you know, in the era of big data, it becomes even more important that we tease out the nuggets using good, powerful analytic techniques and also the business expertise of end users who are skilled in that, in that particular area. And so we focused on being able to transition from that human-based understanding into um, building a model and taking that model of business behavior and pushing it into the real-time system. So it's not just about statistical modeling, and by the way, we have a cutting edge um, closed source execution engine for R, and the only one in the marketplace, 10 to 50 times faster than the, the native open source R engine. So not only about building the right models, but about, or about the automation, but about how you smooth that path 
from human-based kind of insight development through to execution against the, the right opportunities. And then, of course, taking the action, whatever that may be, making a, a contextual offer or redirecting traffic in the supply chain. And there's a hundred different mm -hmm. use cases for, to which that Ray, we're gonna have some fun here. Uh, we're gonna have some fun here. Oh, is that interrupted by Jeff? Right. No, I, just, I was just gonna point out, I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges in this space is we, you know, there's a huge, obviously the market for data visualization is a, is a big market in BI, where you know, you've got a, you're a human being, you're, a, you're an analyst, you're, a, you're a, an executive, and you're looking at some data and you're visualizing it so you can better understand it. But ultimately, you want, you've got to translate that into action, and increasingly with the speed of business, you, you don't have time for a human to sit there and say, well, okay, we're going to make these decisions. I mean, right. the old, you know, whether it's LinkedIn or Amazon is probably the example people understand the most is, you know, people you may know when, on LinkedIn, when you, you uh, log in there, they recommend some people based on all that kind of analytics in the background. And that's an automated process that happened based on a lot of deep data science. And right. that's one of the challenges of going from that deep data science to productionizing that into essentially an application that actually does something. Um, so that's you know an area, I think, John, where there's ripe for opportunity. Yeah, and uh, let me just respond to that and, and then also respond to your early query about Jaspersoft because I think those two kind of fit nicely together. Because um, we've been focusing for a long time at, at Spotfire and at Tipco on creating applications that are very easy for a, a business user to interact with the statistical model. So they don't need to be a statistician in order to take advantage of that intellectual property that's developed. So. But that's within the analytic sense kind of business intelligence kind of framework in the context of delivering an application to the user that's dealing with the data and so on. Now, uh, there's been a kind of long-standing rule that only about 70 or 75 percent of people who need or who would benefit from business intelligence are actually using it. And one of the hypothesis, hypotheses of the JasperSoft organization is that the reason for that is not because they're not smart or they don't need it, but they're actually their typical business use case is in an application that does a particular job, whether that's a supply chain application or a CRM application or so on. It's not a BI application, it's an, a business application. So the Jaspersoft commitment and now the TIPCO commitment is to deliver on what we call embedded analytics. So we realize that people can't always spin around in their ergonomic chair you know, from one application to a business intelligence tool to a statistics tool. We want to bring the analytics to the user who's making the decision in the context of that business process. And so that's, that's where they fit. Spotfire is more focused on an analytic use case, whereas Jaspersoft is focused on an in-process decision-making use case. So they're very yeah. distinct. They do so blur somewhere in the middle. So embedding, as Colin says, put smarts on the data. That's a Jaspersoft where you're more analyst with the Yeah, Spotfire. I think Jaspersoft has put the smarts in the app. In the you know, app if yes. you're already building an application, a SaaS-based application, yep. or just a desktop application that's going to be used in your organization, you still need decision-making content. And yep. so let's allow yep. that to be possible as well. So I, I got to get your take on something. We'll have some fun here. Um, I wrote a, cup, a tweet earlier. What's the difference between a statistician and a data scientist? The answer? Oh, salary. That's a, that's a great, salary. Yeah. So that's that, a great hold on, that was my yeah. that was snarky tweet, right. which, which uh, I just, um, Sunil Rawat just said, "Hey, that's highly irresponsible." <laughs> tweeted back, "Highly <laughs> irresponsible statement. Statistics are an infinitely small portion of the tools data science is used." So it was overheard comment that we overheard in the cube. I posted that was kind of a you know joke. Um, but this data science bubble we're in right now, there's a lot of demand. Wall Street Journal highlighted this week, um, statistician, statistician, analyst, or business user versus the hardcore data scientist. Obviously, the salary is going to way on the data science side, so it, it actually is kind of true, but the point is, the question about that uh, Sunil brought up was, we're now comparing disciplines. Your job is to make analytics easy for people. So, what is going on with the data science bubble? Well, you know, every statistician that I know has changed their title to data scientist now. So, I mean, in, in some part, you know, your, your statement is kind of true, and, and actually, practically speaking, statisticians who work in a business, like I came from the semiconductor yield management business, those folks know a lot about that business. So they, they start to actually take on some of the characteristics of the hypothetical data scientist who knows about stats, who knows about the business, and who knows about programming. Um, but so, you know, I think they're kind of merging in, into one. But, you know, um, to, to respond to your other point, absolutely one of our primary goals is to make easy things uh, faster to do, um, but also to support the more complex use cases. And maybe a more global statement would be uh, to facilitate each player's role in the process of constructing and using an application that spans all of those disciplines. Let's get so as, as a statistician, I should be able to take that IP and broadcast it through the app 
instead of you know having a you know office hours. If you do your job properly, then there'll be a level playing field, in my opinion, on the roles and salary, except for the cor corner cases of you know the ninjas who are like just super gurus worth the worth their money. Uh, but I want to bring that another level. So we're in this notification economy, I'm calling it. You know, my notifications are going off on my phone, Twitter updates, all these apps sending me <laughs> notifications. Um, you guys basically invented and, and created this stable platform for complex events. It's not getting any easier with today, with the mobile apps. So how do you look at this new API economy, notification economy? I mean, Tom Davenport wrote the attention economy in 2001. Right. Um, this is all happening right now at a whole nother level. So what's your, what are you guys doing around this? Well, there's kind of two things to say. One, one thing is what's, what's kind of state of the art and uh, that we support, which is a little bit along the lines of what we were speaking about earlier. We have the technology so that the, the, the data scientists or statisticians of the world can easily you know, construct the right models to do better um, you know, targeting of whatever it is, whether it's an offer or a campaign or, or what have you. And then, you know, the infrastructure for deploying that into, in, in, into a high-speed kind of event-driven uh, methodology. So using our technology, you can get, you can be met much better targeted and get the message where you, where you want it to be. And we really do believe we're at the cutting edge of that whole soup to nuts closed loop process. Having said that, um, you talk about this kind of signal to noise ratio. Um, we hope that the best possible targeting and alignment of the offer and the customer will get their attention. But the fact of the matter is there's a whole bunch of other stuff happening at the same time. So the TIBCO bus was a term that everyone would talk about, the service bus. Um, what is that now? I mean, what is the, the new bus? Is it a cloud bus, mobile bus, data bus? Is it? Now, new architecture, yeah, how good, is that? Good question. Well, you know, the bus as a concept persists in exactly the you know, way that Vivek envisioned it. Um, we shouldn't have to be doing point-to-point -point routing uh, from multiple technologies. You know, it's a, you know, a, a multiplicative problem instead of a linear problem. So if you can have one conduit into which all of the different sources and sinks of information and action can flow, that's a good idea. So we've been doing that on a kind of enterprise on-premise, on-premises basis, if you will. But we do have a cloud bus offering, which is, you know, as you think about organizations who are on their journey to the cloud or maybe will get part of the way there uh, only, there's going to be naturally a requirement for integration that spans internal premises systems and then true SaaS or cloud-based But systems. you see the bus relevant in the social Absolutely. omnidirectional. Absolutely, it becomes even more important because now there's even more sources. Not, now you have multiple clouds to connect to each other and also to the, the on-premises um, data and, and Well, systems we heard from um, the Royal, Phillips Royal, the international issue is huge. Now you have buses for parking data in Germany versus that's that's a whole other set of constraints, right? What do the regulations We're say about weird where, the, the, where right the data now. needs to be? Yeah, but but fundamentally, if, if if it's not illegal, you know, it might be a good idea to have a kind of single source of flow for that information, so you're not point-to-point -point wiring spaghetti. Okay, so now let's bring it back. What is TIBCO? I mean, just explain to the folks out there who may not be familiar with the company, share with your own words. What is the TIBCO? What's the company? What's the DNA? What's the, what's the core secret yeah, what sauce? Is, what does the brand stand for? What does the brand stand for? So TIBCO you know, was invented. It's, it stands for, if you want, the information bus company. So it's, and that's still true today, just as the topic that we were on, we want to reduce the kind of spaghetti code that needs to be done in order to cr create an, uh, a holistic organization in which all of its parts are functioning, functioning smoothly. So toward that end, we've added on top of that bus, we've added componentry that are, is, is useful for, um, so the bus you might call integration. Right, that the bus is the concept that you build with that integration toolkit. Then we have analytics for decision making against the data that's flowing through or about to flow through or has finished flowing through the bus. And we have event processing, which is you know, kind of high grading that deluge of information. Um, by the way, every big data source started as a real time stream. So you know, our mantra is to glean the information that you can from the big data, but then put that model upstream so you're taking the action before it's too late. So we've got um, analytics, we've got event processing, um, we've got um, 
a number of other technologies, social and mobile. We've got technologies for social and mobile. So really it's just a few pillars. And then you know, the, the idea is that we're uh, very, very focused on putting those pieces together in a smooth way rather than just saying, hey, here's a bunch of stuff that right. we have to sell. So where are you looking, East Coast, West Coast? I personally am here in the Boston, Boston office, okay. just a few blocks down, but Tipco is headquartered in Palo Alto. Great. Mm -hmm. Uh, so quickly, obviously, we're here at the HP Vertica Big Data Conference. Yes. What's what's your relationship with uh, with Vertica? Uh, you know, obviously, it's a source of data. It's a it's a processing engine. Uh, is it? I imagine the relationship is you know versus, from the analytics point of view, uh, kind of sitting on top of Vertica. But in yeah. your own words, what's kind of what's the role uh, and the relationship between the two? Yeah, well, Vertica is very much in the data management business, both in terms of what they're doing, you know, literally with the Vertica database, but also in the way that they manage and, and um, interact with and utilize NoSQL sources. Um, and Spotfire and, Tech, and Tibco are not in the data management business. Right. Instead, we're in the decision making and action taking. So, as a matter of fact, it's pretty much a perfect fit. And we're actually working with uh, Vertica and HP at many, many different levels. Mm -hmm. HP, of course, is a big deliverer of service and does implementations of TIPCO technology. But also, uh, we're working on a number of um, you know, active projects right now in the area of this kind of closed loop, event driven uh, use case that we've been uh, talking about. And Ken actually is speaking at the moment, is saying a little bit about uh, one of the projects that we're working on. So we got some commentary from Sunil. We got some virtual participation here on the crowd chat. Um, he says, every stat I said every statistician changes their title to data scientist. Chiropractors claim to be doctors too, sometimes helps. Love statistics, but it seems that anyone can pass for data science these days. And he says, I've routinely seen big data projects fail even at Fortune 10 companies because people can't tell the difference between data scientists, stats, coders, quote, pet peeve. So his pet peeve is, there is a little bit of title inflation going on with the yeah, you could say the reverse though too. You could say that a lot of data scientists are pretending to be statisticians. I mean, so there's definitely, uh, you know, a, a broad set of skills that you need to be proficient at in order to be a true data scientist if you, if you take the McKinsey definition, uh, if you want. Brad, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate the commentary. We went, we went geek, we went uh, high level. Thanks so much for My your, pleasure. your content. This is theCUBE live in Boston here at the uh, HP Big Data Conference. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.